it's still one of the few areas where I think we can make some progress. So the starting point is really industrialized fishing. And there's both the mentality and the technology as key drivers here. So the, the first one is the idea that we can approach fisheries the same way as we do producing goods in a factory, or even the way we approach land-based agriculture. So if you, you know, put in a certain number of inputs, you can expect to get a certain number of outputs, but wild fisheries don't really work that way. And then second is technology. Technology keeps improving to the point where today it's almost too good. So we're just catching all the fish. So overfishing in general is kind of the main problem, you know, with these like factors feeding into it. But then when you kind of drill down into how you manage the problem, there's issues with illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing or IUU fishing. And then you've got issues of poor governance, corruption, a lack of transparency. The, the biggest issue is climate change. That's going to continue to be a problem and just exacerbate everything else. Uh, but we're also destroying marine habitat through destructive fishing practices, through pollution, through ran, land reclamation, and so on. Yeah, so for global fishing, China has a large distant water fishing industry, and that's the industry that fishes on the high seas, which is the area of the ocean that belongs to no country, and also in the exclusive economic zones or EZs of other countries, and that's usually arranged through a bilateral fisheries access agreement. And so their, their fleet is the largest in the world now, but there are other countries that have had a head start on this. So um, when the Soviet Union was around, they were the largest. Uh, Japan is a really big player, Taiwan, South Korea, Spain. But yeah, so China has not been around as long, but now they are the largest. And they also provide the largest number of subsidies to that industry compared to other countries. So it's the industrial fishers that, that make the big impact. They have the big ships and a lot of those big vessels and the technology has been propped up by subsidies given to the industry. And that's still a really big problem today. There's a lot of talk at the WTO about how to reduce those fishery subsidies. And the problem with subsidies is that it makes the industry profitable when it would otherwise not be. In terms of the ownership structure, a lot of those are state-owned enterprises, um, but the industry is being increasingly privatized. And it's, it's hard to say definitively, you know, if like all of them are getting subsidies, but uh, for, for the most part, they probably are, um, if anything, because it's just cost prohibitive to not engage in fishing without subsidies. Yeah, so China in the past, and still does to a certain extent, sell to more developed areas like the European Union, Japan, the United States. Those are kind of the, the areas that are known for their, you know, really high demand for seafood. Uh, but the Chinese now are actually shipping a lot more of their catch back home to China um, from their distant water fleet. And they've started to build up a retail industry in China to market that seafood. Uh, back home. So the U.S. plays a, a really large role uh, in consumer demand for seafood. But we actually don't know a great deal of detail about where that comes from, how sustainable those imports are. And that's because what the U.S. is doing is taking a lot of its own catch and sending it abroad for processing and then re-importing it. So we're not properly accounting for that. So having a little bit more detail uh, about how that trade works would be really useful. And so that's another example of lack of transparency. So the U.S. has taken steps to address this. In the last couple of years, they started the Seafood Import Monitoring Program, or SIMP. Um, but there's still a lot of issues that we need to work out uh, in terms of seafood traceability. There's still a lot of work to do. Things are moving in the right direction, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. So there was a really interesting arrangement that started in 1995, and it was the U.S.-China Shiprider Agreement, and that was to patrol uh, high seas drift net fishing of anadromous fish stocks. So those are stocks like salmon. 
And it allowed for, it was a Coast Guard partnership, so it allowed for the US and China to board each other's Coast Guard vessels to, to patrol illegal fishing in the North Pacific. And you know, they, they made some really good you know, apprehensions of people engaged in illegal fishing, and not that long ago either, but you know, because of the tensions between the US and China currently, my understanding is that there's really not much going on in, on that front. I think it's either temporarily or, or you know, more permanently discontinued. But I, I always thought that was a really great example of you know, how we could work together. And then under the Obama administration, when the strategic and economic dialogues were happening, the last couple of years of, of that dialogue, there was an ocean sidetrack. And this was you know, devoted to these ocean issues. And I thought that was really a great way to make progress on, on some of these issues. And so that's not going on anymore. We can partner on IU fishing. The US is also trying to make some progress on the Maritime Safe Act. And China also recently has made a lot of progress on IU fishing, at, at least in terms of their laws. The, the Chinese have stated that this is an important issue. And compared to like 10 years ago, the Chinese were denying that they had any problems with IU fishing. So because the, these priorities match, I think there's a lot of room for cooperation. And then the other thing is uh, marine environment is it's a great, it's one of the few areas I think that is remaining in this, you know, tense period of U.S.-China relations where we can have constructive cooperation because it's, it's not as politically sensitive um, compared to other issues. And also marine environment isn't as high tech as some other industries. So there's less fear that the Chinese could be stealing U.S. technology on, on stuff like this. You know, I'm, I'm concerned that when the U.S. is halting academic collaborations and, you know, putting a limit uh, on, on this, ki this kind of exchange, you know, which is heightened, of course, by COVID and the travel restrictions there, that areas like marine environment will also, you know, face obstacles in, you know, in terms of making progress on some of these issues. But I do think there's a lot that we can still do with China because we have a lot of these, these shared interests. I think it's really important that progress continue on this front and it can also you know serve as an example for other areas of contention too